didn't traumatize you enough with the Phoenix Sinclair case season 2 ender, today should probably do the trick for you. The story that I'm bringing you today resulted in 103 recommendations to changes to the child welfare system in Canada in 2014, which is a full 12 years after this young man's death. Only one year after the inquest into Phoenix's death was completed with its 62 recommendations. Phoenix died in 2005 and her inquest wasn't started until 2011, six years after her death. In today's story, there will be an 11 year gap between this little Peanut's unfortunate and preventable death and the starting of a coroner's inquest. This is the murder of Jeffrey Baldwin. his mom Yvonne and dad Richard Baldwin on January 20th, 1997. According to one report, he was born in Seattle, but no other reports say that. This story itself takes place in Toronto. Yvonne and Richard both had somewhat complicated childhoods. Yvonne had been raised by her mom Elva Botanu and had two sisters. Elva had married her husband Norman Kidman sometime in the mid-70s. Uh, it had been a childhood of poverty and by the age 1980s, her mom Elva had been running a daycare out of her home sponsored by Toronto's Catholic Children's Aid Society. How exactly her childhood was complicated, I'm going to get to a little bit later. Yvonne had first gotten pregnant with Jeffrey's little sister when she was 16, and she moved in with Richard. There was fighting between the couple, so Elva agreed to take the baby for a few days to give them a break. But Yvonne and Richard's first child would remain with Elva and Norman. Yvonne and Richard went on to have another daughter and then Jeffrey. When Jeffrey's older sister was seen by a neighbor being shaken by Yvonne, both Jeffrey and his sister were also placed with his grandparents by the uh, Catholic Children's Aid Society in 1998, uh, which I'm going to refer to from now on as CCAS, uh, only a month or two after Jeffrey had been born. Yvonne and Richard would also go on to have a son who, like his siblings, was taken by CCAS and given to Elva and Norman. By November of 2002, so after four years of living with his maternal grandparents in the subsidized rundown Victorian style townhouse in Toronto's East End at 354 Woodfield Road that Jeffrey was living in had become pretty full. In fact, there were a total of 12 people living in the three bedroom house by that time. The rundown from what I could piece together was Elva and Norman. Tammy Kidman, who was their adult daughter, and her partner, Mike Rietmeyer. Tammy's sister, Yvette Kidman, and her partner, James Mills. So that's six adults. Uh, and then we have Jeffrey, his two sisters, and younger brother, and two of Tammy's children. So six kids, all age ranges from two to ten. Jeffrey at the time was five, so right in the middle. According to CTV reporting, Tammy and her children moved in around August or September of 2002, and Mike Rietmeyer, who's Tammy's boyfriend, had just moved in the last week in November of 2002. Sounds like, well, at least Tammy and her kids were only supposed to be there for about three months to save up some money, uh, so they were all sleeping in the living room as a solution to the space issue. The deal with the other adult daughter and her boyfriend, James, I'm not sure what their arrangement was or how long they were living there. If it sounds like chaos, it was. In the fairly early morning hours of November 30th, 2002, Elva made a call to 911 telling them that she had a problem. She said that Jeffrey had recently stopped eating and drinking and might have a touch of the flu. She says, quote, apparently my grandson is not breathing right now. She asked for a police car to be sent, but the dispatcher reminded her that an ambulance should be the first responders. When paramedics, including Mark Dugas and Fire Captain Royal Bradley, arrived, they were struck by how very wrong everything just felt. The lights in the house were off. There wasn't any panicked-looking adults standing in the door waiting, which was pretty typical for that kind of call. No one rushed to answer their knocks on the door, even. When the door finally opened, a horrific waft of urine hit them, and Elva told them to keep their voices down because there was a child sleeping on the couch in the living room, and according to Dugas, she seemed pretty annoyed that they were there and led them to the kitchen. And there, laying on the table on a towel, like actually laying on the table like a roast, was the body of a very small child, a very emaciated child. 
The boy, who was Jeffrey, had exposed ribs and sores covering his body. Mark Dugas would later testify, quote, You see something like that and it's just soul-destroying. It was the complete and utter destruction of dignity to any child or human being, in my opinion. Even more shocking to Dugas was the reaction of the other adults in the house. Quote, where was the emotion? There wasn't one damn tear shed. When they asked for a medical history of Alva, she said his history is fine. She said that he had seen a doctor two weeks ago and had been fine. Bradley, the fire captain, didn't buy a word of it. When Jeffrey was taken out and put into the back of the ambulance where they made attempts to revive him, not one of the people in the house came out to check on his condition. Something was seriously wrong in this house. Jeffrey Baldwin, just weeks shy of his sixth birthday, died alone on his way to the Toronto Six Kids Hospital. Homicide detective Mike Davis was the first investigator on the scene and the lead detective following Jeffrey's case. Mike, to this day, is haunted by the scene that first confronted him that day, telling the Fifth Estate in 2006 that it was the worst death of a child he had ever seen. It appeared that Jeffrey had been dead for a while, at least a couple of hours. Mike toured the House of Horrors and found a bedroom upstairs with a lock on the outside, later determined to be the bedroom of Jeffrey and his younger sister, with a child's bed and a crib. The room itself was not heated as the rest of the house was and was very cold. The room reeked of urine and feces. The coroner actually pressed down on one of the mattresses and urine literally gushed from it. The floor surrounding the beds was stained with urine and rotting through from the ammonia. A bag of dirty diapers was on the floor as well as scattered bits of dog food. Catholic Children's Aid was immediately brought in and seized all of the surviving children and placed them into foster care. The autopsy concluded that Jeffrey had died due to bacterial pneumonia, a result of breathing fecal matter into his little lungs, which created septic shock. The underlying cause of all of it had been prolonged and serious starvation and malnutrition. He weighed just 21 pounds, so actually less than four years earlier when he arrived before his first birthday. James Mills, who was one of the ad adults in the house, his police interview was later played in court. Just 12 hours after Jeffrey had been pronounced dead, he was very unemotionally sitting down with Detective Kim O'Toole and telling her that he actually hadn't woken up when the ambulance came. He had a sinus infection which made sleeping difficult and told Kim, I stirred, I didn't wake up. He told Kim matter-of-factly that he knew Jeffrey was dying. When asked why he felt that way, he said he had just said to a vet the night before, I was like, I don't think he's long for this world. James also saw that the very night of his death, Jeffrey had crawled up the stairs to his cage of a room because he was too weak to walk. During the night, he said, quote, I heard him cough and cry through the night and he was coughing and he wasn't crying. It was more of a silent weep or mope, like he was weeping to himself. Around 2 a.m. that morning, and then after that, it was dead quiet. An ironic choice of words. James had been up that night playing video games, and he never checked on Jeffrey. After the autopsy report was in and interviews were done, Elva Botnu and Norman Kidman were arrested and charged with murder, quite obviously. Why no one else in the house was charged, I have no stinking idea, because in my opinion, they are all culpable for this young little peanut's death, almost as much as Alva and Norman. But during the investigation, Detective Mike Davis found a whole whack of facts that were completely outrageous, and, and he became disgusted with all of the events and circumstances that led to Jeffrey's death. So let's take a look at some of the things that were uncovered, not just about the days and weeks leading up to Jeffrey's death, but going way back that should never have happened. Um, this is not in particular order of discovery. There's just way too much to try and sort through what information was uncovered first. So I'm just going to go through it in point form. In the 1970s, Elva's first baby, Eva, died of what was originally thought to be pneumonia. Some reports she was five months old and someone say, some say five years old. Um, I couldn't find the consensus, but the autopsy discovered that Eva had fractures on her shoulders, elbows, and wrists. Elva was sentenced to one year probation as they couldn't conclude that the injuries had resulted in her death. But what's interesting is that Yvonne and her two sisters had no idea there had been another sister born before them. So that leads me to believe that she's probably closer to five months old than five years. 
1978, Norman was convicted of assault and sentenced to two years probation for abuse against Elvis' son and daughter. Yes, there are two children also not known to have existed by Yvonne and her sisters. They were removed after the assault charge and went into foster care. Now, the Fifth Estate managed to track the son, Fred, down in 2006, and he reported to them that he had been forced to live in confinement and systematically starved, forced to drink out of the toilet during his years with his mother and Norman. Fred and his sister were removed by none other than the Catholic Children's Aid Society. They had records in their files of the two convictions and kept tabs on the family for a few years, but by 1998, when her grandchildren started being put into her care, they didn't do background checks because it wasn't normal protocol for biological family members. What Fred said pretty much mirrored the treatment Jeffrey and his sister got. Fred relayed to the Fifth Estate that he remembers a CCAS worker named Helen telling Elva to get her act together, so he feels that she was aware of the abuse, but when she would leave, the beatings would continue. Avon and Richard were also interviewed by the Fifth Estate in 2006, and they both say that Elva had basically scammed them into handing over their children to her so that Elva could use the children as a source of income from the government. Now, that is likely true for the most part, but it felt a little bit like controlling a narrative on their part. So although I believe that Elva was pretty pushy and manipulative to get the kids, Richard and Yvonne visited the house and saw concerning things, but they didn't go against their mother and report anything to the authorities. Uh, they said it was because they wouldn't be believed because of the history of losing their kids to Elva over the years. Possible, but trying is at least a protective thing to do. Now we move on to some of the things testified to at Elva and Norma's trial about the years between 1998 and 2002. In some of the saddest testimony was from the foster mother who took in Yvonne and Richard's surviving children. Her name is Protected. She testified that the children came to her in pretty bad shape. Apparently, only Jeffrey and his older sister were treated particularly badly. The other sister wasn't, but for some reason, Jeffrey and his older sister were absolutely hated by the entire family. The four-year-old wasn't treated as badly, but didn't understand why all of a sudden they were sitting at the kitchen table with everyone, and she kept asking where their pig wall was. The foster mother was confused until she learned that Jeffrey and his sister were forced to stand against the wall and eat table scraps with their hands, which was called the pig wall, and they were both referred to as pigs. One evening, as the older sister and the victim of the horrendous abuse was brushing her teeth and foaming, you know, with all the toothpaste and that, the foster mother told her, okay, honey, get a drink, whereupon the little girl put her face in the toilet because that is what they had to resort to for drinks. Foster mother testified that she just couldn't seem to feed them enough. They were always so very hungry. This foster mother was also tracked down by the Fifth Estate. Um, those guys are relentless and would get interviews that no one else does, I tell you. Anyways, she told them that when the kids came to her, they were traumatized and they slowly revealed to her what was happening in the house and how Jeffrey and his older sister was, were singled out for abuse and neglect, eating table scraps with their hands. She had to teach them how to use cutlery and she had locked them in the, this disgusting room for hours at a time, never seeing the outdoors. She saw the wounds on the girl that the urine that she was forced to sleep in and live had done to her legs and genitals. They were also forced to walk in circles for exercise uh, with things thrown at them if they stopped. An investigator for CCAS testified that the home itself had heat and was furnished appropriately and fairly clean. But the bedroom that Jeffrey and his sister were locked in had no heat, barely any furniture except for the urine-soaked mattresses, and was generally in disrepair and appalling. The medical examiner, Dr. Jeffrey Wilson, testified that Jeffrey had no body fat and weighed 21.3 pounds and was only 3 foot 1 tall. Very small for an almost 6-year-old. He described bruises to his face and abrasions on his neck, abdomen, and inner thighs. He also said that his legs had a bad scaly rash. There were sores on his genitals, likely the result of prolonged contact with urine. And he went on to describe how Jeffrey had developed pneumonia a few days before his death. Fecal bacteria had gotten into his bloodstream, causing septic shock that would have made it difficult to breathe. The surviving children gave recorded testimony about their treatment in the house they testified that all the things going on in the house were to be kept secret to keep child services from finding out. 
Now, remember James Mills, one of the adults living in the home who did nothing about the abuse he witnessed? He testified that Alva had told him those two kids are $600 a month. According to him, Alva and Norman knew they were in bad shape, but he wouldn't ever take them out of the house because it would get reported to CPS. And then they would lose the money. He didn't report anything because he didn't want to get kicked out of the house and the free room and board that he was getting, and he was afraid of Elva. His solution was to just pretend that he didn't even see Jeffrey. Norman's defense lawyer, Robert Richardson, felt that his best course of action was to suggest that Jeffrey had starved himself out of some form of protest or emotional reason. But Dr. Zulkin, who attempted to treat Jeffrey at the sick kids hospital and who had testified to the condition of little Jeffrey when he was admitted, said that there was no way that there was a lack of iron in his blood which suggested the level of starvation he was in would have taken at least a year to develop. A neighbor to Elva and Norman, Michelle Keene, testified that Elva told her that Jeffrey had poisoned himself by eating lead paint. She also said that Elva had asked her to write a letter to CCAS to support, in support of her to help her get her children back. And this was after Jeffrey's death. Although Michelle admitted that Jeffrey's condition looked appalling to her, um, that he appeared very sick, pale, and very, very small, she didn't report it to the authorities because she figured CCAS was following the family. According to a blog written by Morbidology, which I tried to find in their cited resources, but I couldn't. Um, I couldn't find it as part of the testimony for the inquest, so I'm not able to attest to this being 100% true, but Morbidology reported that someone testified that they overheard a conversation between Yvonne, who is Jeffrey's bio mom, and Elva, where Elva wonders out loud if she would get the insurance life insurance money because she had an insurance policy on Jeffrey, to which her mom Elva said, that's accidental death, I don't know if he's covered. Throughout the entire trial, Elva showed no emotion and shook her head often in disagreement which, with what was being said about her and her actions, prompting Richard's mother and Jeffrey's paternal grandma to tell reporters, although all through court she was shaking her head no to certain things, the judge was saying, maybe the jail time will make her think and there will be a repentance. It didn't take a jury very long to find both Elva and Norman guilty of second-degree murder, and Justice David Watt, who wrote a 500-page sentencing decision on the case, gave them parole ineligibility periods of 20 years for Norman and 22 years for Elva, calling them both morally bankrupt and telling the court that their self-perception is at odds with reality. Uh, she thirsts for control but flees from responsibility. In March 2011, Elva and Norma appealed the decision. Elva's lawyer, James Stribalopoulos, claimed that Elva had an IQ of 69, which made her incapable of making good decisions, stating that Justice, Wep, Justice Watt swept away evidence of Botnu's highly incapacitated mental state. He claims that her low IQ meant that she didn't understand malnutrition and that it could kill a child, and that if she intended Jeffrey to die, she would have not fed him at all instead of giving him occasional table scraps. Norman's lawyer, Richard Lakowski, said that, that it was Elva who did anything and that Norman should only be guilty of manslaughter, if anything, claiming that he was a passive participant. It's morally reprehensible. It makes him an awful human being, but it doesn't make him a murderer. He claims that only Elva had access to the locked bedroom uh, and he was at work most of the days with little contact with any of the kids but their claims didn't sway the Ontario Court of Appeal. Then we fast forward to 2013 when they finally decided looking into the failings of the CCAS was a good idea and Elva and Norma had finally exhausted all of their appeals and the coroner's inquest was heard by a jury. Elva made a call from the Grand Valley Institution in Kitchener, Ontario, where she calls home now, demanding that she be allowed to testify at the inquest. She wanted to voice her opinions and put, an, and put the truth out there in her words. Lawyers argued no way because she would slow down the process by arguing facts presented at trial, and this wasn't about the trial, but more about putting CCAS on trial. Uh, Freya Christensen, the lawyer who represents Jeffrey's siblings, said, There are many things we still don't know about Jeffrey's death and many things we must inquire into. What we do know and what there can be no reasonable dispute about is who killed Jeffrey and how he died. Elva Elva Botineau is a killer who tortured Jeffrey and his siblings while starving him to death. This was an inquest into Jeffrey's death, not a soapbox for his killer. 
In the end, she did testify and made a bit of a mockery of the system. She was asked why she had diplomas on her wall, including one for child psychology, if she dropped out of school in grade nine. She said that they were real and she was just trying to understand what Jeffrey was going through. She also said that Jeffrey was a slow learner. If I asked him to pick up a fork, he would go to the spoon, not the fork. When I put a crayon inside his hand, I would try to get him to do circles on the paper. He wouldn't do it. When I tried to talk with him, it was something else. He would just look at me like it was a cold stare. He didn't want to do it. So she spent her time on the stand talking about Yvonne's lack of parenting and how she desperately didn't want the kids going into foster care, so she graciously offered to take them in. When shown a photo of Jeffrey when he was brought to the hospital, a photo I have seen and you can't and like now can't get out of my head, she was asked, this is the result of your parenting that we've talked about. You see that? She simply replied in a very unemotional and almost defiant tone, yes, I see that. She had the nerve to roll her eyes when Freya Christensen offered or referred to the children's traumatic upbringing. Freya testified that in 2011, when the inquest was held, that the surviving children have been doing very well in foster care. Despite the horrific early upbringing, the children have made a tremendous gains and are getting on with their lives. The siblings will always be impacted by their experiences. However, their resiliency is truly inspiring. The eldest sister is now in university, and the sister who shared a room with Jeffrey and much of the same neglect and mistreatment was in high school at the time with hopes of going to college. His younger brother was described as bright, humorous, and strong-willed and also hopes to go to college. The coroner's inquest found some shocking details that CCAS missed besides the history of abuse, of abuse documented in the original file before she was granted custody of Yvonne's first child. There were two psychological evaluations, both that determined Elva wouldn't have made a good foster mom. The two children, the son and the daughter she had after the first baby Eve died, they alleged alleged that while they had been in Elva's care, they were tied to their beds, locked in dog crates, often for hours at a time, also having to resort to drinking from the toilets. CCAS did supervise Elva for, and her son after her son and daughter were removed, and when she went on to have three more daughters, including Yvonne, there were records of abuse and investigations in those following years, but nothing was ever done about it. The inquest also learned that Jeffrey had never been enrolled in school because, according to Elva, he wasn't still wasn't toilet trained, uh, which I can't imagine he would be when he never got to leave his room except to stand in a wall and hope for table scraps. She also never took him to a doctor in the four years she had him with her. Tammy Kidman, Norman's daughter and one of the other adults living in the house and witness to Jeffrey's neglect and horrific treatment, testified at the inquest that she believed her mother, Elva, when she said doctors had checked Jeffrey out and she, he was fine. Tammy, who actually did study early childhood education, at least for a semester, when asked if she didn't notice him wasting away before her eyes, said, I didn't pay that much attention, to be honest. She also admitted that she never spoke a word to Jeffrey in the last three months of his life. When shown a photo of Jeffrey's, Jeffrey's skeletal body taken before his autopsy and asked, you didn't think that body, that body there with no muscle mass or fat whatsoever, you believed there was nothing that needed to be done for him. And she replied at the time, no, I truly believe my mom was doing what was needed. Her boyfriend, Mike, said he did notice and was bugged by, but didn't want to create friction by reporting it. Yeah, it bugged me. At that point, Tammy and my kids had no place to go, so I was trying in a way not to create friction between Elva and Tammy and everything. I sort of had it in my head that he wasn't going to, that he wasn't going to make it. He says he talked to Jeffrey only a few days before he died. He didn't want to be there anymore, and he wanted to get out. Yeah, he related that he's tortured every day by not doing something about it, but he was scared of Elva and losing his free rent and board. The family's caseworker testified that she had no concerns about Alva, who she thought was a reliable pillar of support when compared to Jeffrey's often volatile, volatile teenage parents, so she never conducted any record checks on her or Norman, and thus began a series of very unfortunate events for little Jeffrey. In the end, the inquest went through over 300 exhibits, including photos. The lawyers felt that Jeffrey didn't just slip through the cracks, but through a whole institutional safety net. 
one of the 103 recommendations the jury gave, um, the, the biggest is that standards have to be reviewed and more thorough background checks of all potential placements, including biological family members need to be done and better training for child protective workers, especially in the areas of interviewing and investigating techniques, because that's how Jeffrey Baldwin had actually fell through the cracks. Among the other inquest recommendations, all child care services have access to relevant records, including family history across the province. Rules be amended so child protection workers must interview and have access to all adults living in the home and verify who they are using legal identification. An advertising campaign to be created to improve awareness about the duty to report child abuse a 1-800 number to be created to report child abuse, Ontario's Ministry of Children and Youth Services to look into penalties for non-professionals who don't report serious child abuse, the placement of a permanent memorial to Jeffrey to be built such as a park uh, so that this is never forgotten. The last recommendation was actually done. More than $36,000 was raised and Greenwood Park now sports a bronze statue of little Jeffrey wearing a Superman cape which was unveiled in 2014. Now, originally, DC Comics refused to allow the logo to be used, but that was later forgotten when they learned the purpose and background behind the statue. And that was the horrific murder of Jeffrey Baldwin and the stain of shame that Child Protective Services just can't seem to shake. I'm going to be back again next week with another case. In that meantime, if you can do your rate, review, blah, blah, blah thing, um, and I really encourage you to sign up for the exclusive content. It's, it's not very expensive, and I do have some really interesting cases in there um, that you might be interested in listening to. As always, thank you so much for listening.